we'll, we'll begin with you, Lev. Okay. Um, so some of you know, artificial intelligence is not a new thing. The field was established in the mid-50s, uh, and already in the early 70s, artists such as Harold Cohen you know, started to use artificial intelligence to create art. So, you know, we're talking about 50, 60 years of work. Uh, I think for probably the rest of the panel, most of our focus will be on the use of particular method of AI, which became popular, I would even say fashionable, in the last eight or nine years, called supervised machine learning, and uh, I assume we'll be discussing in detail the aesthetics of artworks, or at least images, whether we can call them art or not, that's a different question, but images, you know, or sound, or other uh, media forms, which can be created by using, or perhaps misusing in a creative way, supervised machine learning. Uh, what I want to do in my time is to give you an kind of idea, a glimpse of a different way of approaching AI and culture, which is using uh, techniques and elements of AI to look at the aesthetics of already created art and media. Right? So how do we, for example, visualize and understand the structures created by a single painting or you know, three-minute music video? Or how do we understand the variety of aesthetics created by 800 you know, million users of Instagram? Right? We live in a world where billions of people have become digital artists. Right? They daily create you know, trillions of artworks, even by simply applying filters to their photographs or uh, doing something else. So how do we map uh, this artistic universe where we have literally hundreds of millions of people who return involuntarily into artists uh, through uh, computer networks, software, and consumer electronics. So I will show you a few projects uh, created by me and students and collaborators in my lab uh, called Culture Analytics Lab. Uh, so the idea for the lab came in 2005, 12 years ago, and the lab was established in 2007. And our goal was to focus on using computational and visualization methods to think about how we can analyze and visualize patterns and aesthetics in already existing uh, digital or analog artifacts. Uh, so the methods we use fall within right, an area of AI or area of machine learning, which is often referred to as unsupervised machine learning, the term which I find myself very awkward, <laughs> not very elegant, so I actually prefer the term exploratory data analysis. But since we're looking, exploring patterns not in the data, not in the numbers, but the patterns in media, I call this approach exploratory media analysis. Uh, so you're looking at um, 4,500 covers of Time magazine, published between 1923 and 2009, so it's 4,500 covers. Uh, so I call this a kind of a cultural time series. Right? All these covers are similar, they're the same size, you know, they uh, same proportions, uh, with some kind of picture in the middle and then the word time. So in this case, we actually don't have to do anything, right? We don't have to extract features. We can simply present them in a sequence in this kind of grid. And uh, we see about, I counted about 13 or 14 different patterns, uh, so I can spend you know, the rest hour discussing these patterns. So it's patterns over time, changes in color, in saturation, in composition, in the content, in communication strategies. Uh, you can see these kind of color bands. Uh, and here is just the beginning. So this is 1920s going into the 1930s. The color printing was quite expensive, so we first see the covers you know, show particular people, you know, politicians, uh, celebrities of you know, that time, and we, the time editors start introducing color, but first just once in a while, and eventually we start getting more and more color. So the advantage uh, of this representation is that, for example, if I would uh, 
use, you know, let's say, supervised machine learning uh, and use it in a very kind of typical way for classification, right? Uh, I would have to start with some perhaps existing categories, right? So what we pre prefer is instead, you know, simply look at the data, right? Look, make this media archive visible and see what patterns lie there. And uh, what we find is that, as I said, there are lots of patterns. You only see it with scale of patterns and color saturation, but you can see that all the patterns are very gradual, right? So by being able to expose all the data uh, and look at what, all the data together in this kind of sorted way, you can see the shape, right, of a data set, uh, the, kind of, you know, the shape of a landscape of this data, which is in a way a very classical idea of uh, exploratory data analysis, but applied to media. Now, we can also go further, right, and start using some very kind of basic building blocks of uh, machine learning, which is feature extraction. And, you know, I mean, you may hear more about, about it in, a, in the rest of the panel. Uh, so today people celebrate, you know, supervised machine learning because you don't have to manually uh, decide what features to extract from media, so the features are learned. And that's, again, very useful you know, for classification or perhaps, you know, style transfer or other techniques. But when you explore these cultural data sets, it's useful to actually use single features because then you know exactly what's going on, so your uh, visualization, right, is interpretable. So in this case, we're extracting a single feature, which is the average saturation of a cover. So this is the close-up. So on the x-axis, this covers are organized by time of publication. On the y-axis, we're organized by average saturation. I mean, again, we can use more complex features, we can use combination of features, but for now, we'll just use saturation, and we can see that, again, you know, we don't get like a random variation, but in fact, there's a particular pattern, a kind of wavy-like patterns. So in the beginning, right, the covers are mostly black and white, so the range of saturation is very small, even it gets bigger, and I'm going to zoom in on this area in the center, uh, which compares 1960s to 1970s, right? So one thing which we see here, even if you don't know statistical meaning of the term variability, you, know, right, you can look and see visually directly the changing variability of uh, a kind of cultural flow of a cultural data set. So on the, on the left side, right, the range between the lowest covers and the highest covers is larger. So in terms of saturation feature, right, variability is much larger, right? So there's more experimentation, there's a larger range. And then in the 70s, there's a kind of compression. And people have also applied this analysis of changing variability to history of music uh, and other cultural fields. Okay? Now, since you are guys you know, from kind of digital arts and electronic music field, I don't have to explain you what it is. So here we take each cover and we sample it by simply taking one uh, pixel line from the middle, so it's a kind of slice. And, uh, it's another interesting kind of what I call direct visualization, where we don't even have to measure variability, but we can see visually how, for example, on the, again, left side, there is this part, which is all yellow, and that corresponds to the use of uh, painting uh, to paint kind of heroes of the Second World War, and then variability changes. So if you try to predict, right, what will be the kind of the sample color of, of the next cover, it will be much harder. So the entropy is increasing. Uh, now, let's continue and now look at uh, a data set using two features. Uh, so the feature which I'll focus on is one which uh, sorts this data set, which is one million pa manga pages, right? So it's 887 manga publications, and uh, we downloaded from a web, so it's uh, over one million manga pages. This was rendered on a single iMac in 2009, so it actually took like two days. Now it'll be a bit faster. And the feature uh, which we used to situate this one million manga pages in this two-dimensional space, which I call a style space, right, the aesthetic space. Of course, you know, obviously two features, uh, so in this case, entropy on the vertical dimension and, um, uh, in fact, standard deviation on the horizontal dimension, do not cover all aspects, right, all the dozens of aspects of aesthetics, but we do allow us to look at a particular slice of this multidimensional aesthetic space, and we can see what is the shape of this field, right? Um, so what we find, we're going to zoom in on the kind of, right, along the kind of vertical edge 
vertical right edge with cloud. So the one extreme, right, the entropy is very low. Uh, so uh, the manga is very black and white, right? There is not lots of texture, not lots of 3D, not lots of detail. Even as we kind of go up, right, we start getting more detail, more texture, more work. Even eventually we get to the top of this cloud, you know, which is highly detailed, more realistic. And um, what's interesting, right, is uh, you can look at this shape and ask some questions, right? You can say, so the shape, right, this kind of cloud, the style space, the aesthetic space of manga, it's thicker in some areas and thin in other areas. Right? You don't say it here because you know, the pages overlap themselves, but you can see, you can ask and see why kind of creativity of manga artists over a few decades have focused on particular aesthetic possibilities and neglected our possibilities. You can see how this cloud is kind of getting very thinner in the lower left corner and in the upper right corner. And you can see it kind of more clearly if you simply visualize this as points, right? So you get the distribution with single center and then things are kind of thinning out on both edges. Uh, so you can also use it as a diagnostic tool, right? So for example, if you want to become famous manga artist, don't draw a manga which will be placed right in the center of this cloud, but draw a manga which will appear somewhere in the edges, you know, and this way you, know, you may be more original. So, uh, so here you know, we're using kind of only two features. We can also use multiple features, you know, hundreds of features, and we can use more sophisticated techniques of mapping, uh, such as dimension reduction methods, such as principal component analysis, TSNI, and others. We have done it. But uh, again, the advantage of using single features is you know exactly what's going on, and if these features correspond in some intuitive way to, in fact, aesthetic dimensions of your media data set, you get some insights about the patterns of creativity over time. Um, oh, here I want to show you one more thing. So one interesting thing, right, about uh, this example is that, you know, there are no particular clusters, right? You get this one continuous field. So partly it's artifact of a description methods. Because if you're using language, if you describe style or aesthetic using language, the language will always divide the world into discrete categories. Right? Whereas when you measure things using numbers, right, so both informatics and visualization, we're going to see a world in terms of continuous differences, small differences. So partly you get this one kind of single continuous field, right, this single continuous distribution because of uh, mathematics, but it also reflects something interesting, right? When you look at this large sample of manga, one million pages, you actually find that all the different aesthetic possibilities have been realized and from like, right, from the most kind of uh, icon-like, most graphic to most detailed, everything has been filled in, right? So all the possibilities have been realized. But normally, right, we think of particular artists or particular artwork as having a style, right? So when I did this, I thought, well, maybe I should apply this method and to look at the distribution of a single manga publication, because surely a single manga publication will have a particular style. It will only occupy a particular part of the space. So I applied this to over 800 you know, manga books, and what I found is in some cases, the pages would, be, you know, would, would occupy like only a small part of the space, so we can actually talk about particular style. In other cases, we're all over, right? So in fact, uh, this, you know, this is as big as one million pages, and this is only about 800, you know, 800 pages long book. So it turns out that when we use this kind of methods and interpret results, uh, that the very basic concepts, you know, which we take for granted when we talk about art and aesthetics, such as a style, uh, turn out to be problematic, right? Because maybe it turns out that many works do not have a style, right? A painting or film doesn't necessarily have one style. The style may be changing over time, right? Just as when you see, for example, like various performances last night, we didn't really have aesthetic unity, right? Different parts were in very different styles. We kind of know that, but I think habitually, we're used to thinking of uh, a single work as having a distinct style. Um, so I'll show you, have like two more minutes? Yeah? So I'll show you one more thing. This actually has sound, but it doesn't matter. So that's a project I've done in collaboration with you know, great uh, uh, data artists, Moritz Stefaner and our people. And it's, a, you know, it's an old project, it's from 2014. It was actually done in the late 2013 when selfie was just becoming popular. So here we 
extended with techniques to create a number of visualizations and the interactive interface uh, to compare uh, selfie images which were shared at the time in Instagram you know, from five different cities. So as you can see, we're still using this kind of visualizations which consists, they graphs, but the graphs which consist from single images. So you see much more detailed than if we reduce these graphs to simply lines and points. And we have also used some you know, basic uh, computer vision uh, to measure various properties of these images. Uh, we right? we had we, you know, the size of the head, we had orientation, in the position of eye, and even you know, eight basic emotions. Of course, you know, we, uh, at this point, there's only one API uh, to do this work. Uh, so we don't know exactly which images you know, that uh, this API was trained, um, but so the motion uh, which it detected you know, were sometimes a bit problematic, but nevertheless, it was very, very interesting, right? So here the idea was to extend this method, so now start comparing, uh, at least begin comparing Kind of aesthetic patterns and the aesthetics of particular genre of contemporary digital media, which is Instagram across different cities. And uh, this is just a one kind of visualization of many from this project, where we have five cities, Bangkok, Berlin, Moscow, New York, and Sao Paulo. And uh, we have about 640 selfies, which were sampled from each city from the same week. And when the selfies uh, above the axis are female, which the computer identified as female. We also use mechanical Turk. Results are very similar. Even the, lower, the ones which are below the axis are male. So you can see, for example, that in Moscow at the time, you know, the ratio of female to male selfies was almost five to one, whereas in Bangkok it was only one to 1.8. And then the selfies which are on the, on the right, of which graph were ones which the computer identified as happier. Uh, and again, this, there are also different patterns. So, um, so I will stop here because I think I'm done my 15 minutes. But this is the idea of uh, kind of using uh, computational methods. Some of them are AI methods, or machine learning methods, and supervised machine learning. Some of them are simply visualization uh, to look at the aesthetics of both digitized historical artifacts, and we have millions of you know, paintings, architecture, designs, music, which has now been digitized, and also the aesthetics of contemporary digital media. And as I said. Um, I'm particularly interested in using and adapting techniques of exploratory uh, data analysis or so-called unsupervised machine learning as a way to kind of understand and see the structure and the aesthetic patterns across you know, billions of contemporary media being created uh, as opposed to starting from existing categories. You can also use uh, kind of uh, supervised machine learning. You can use it in creative ways. Uh, but uh, for me, you know, what is interesting about uh, this analysis is to kind of see what I don't see, right? Because if I start with uh, uh, existing categories, right? If I start with give computers, you know, some examples of things in really existing categories, I will only find more things in the same categories. So in other words, I will kind of confirm what I already know. So in some ways, you can perhaps think of this approach as machine unlearning. Unlearning what I already know, what I think, what I presume about art and aesthetics. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lev. <clears throat> thank you, Lev. My name is Kenrick, and thank you, Lev, for that setup. Um, I lead this program called the Artists and Machine, Artists and Machine Intelligence. We're a group at Google Research. Um, we bring artists in to work with AI researchers at Google and produce art projects that use AI. Um, before we get into the work that we do, I, I like to stop and have a brief moment of meditation on this 300,000-year-old hand axe. And the reason I like to do that is because of some research that was done recently at Emory University by Dietrich Stout and his team, which suggests that this the process of making tools actually changes our, our, our brains, changes our neurology. And in fact, what his team found was that the process of making these stone tools and chipping at them um, involved this kind of gestural activity that naturally uh, led to communication and may have actually been the precursor to speech. So when it comes to our relationships with tools, they can bring out latent languages, latent possibilities uh, that are dormant within us. And so with 
the use of machine learning, especially for creative purposes, uh, I like to frame this project within uh, the idea that we may be generating new possibilities within our own brains and our own minds as we use these tools. And I'm going to focus a little bit on, I'm going to show some artwork, I'm going to focus on a particular aspect of these tools. In general, I've uh, frame this in terms of language, but for today I'm going to talk about aesthetic postures that emerge from our relationships with these tools as we use them to make art and show a couple projects and give some leads on where maybe we might be going with that. So here's a, a digitally reprojected image of the anamorphic skull and Hans Holbein and the Youngers painting the ambassadors from 1553. There's the original painting with a daguerreotype that was actually in the previous presentation, <laughs> uh, the first selfie. Um, the reason I show these together is to show the use of lenses, actually. Lenses uh, would have been necessary to produce the anamorphic image in the first painting, and lenses obviously are necessary to produce photographs. Here you have Ronnie Horn's You Are the Weather, a sort of conceptual photo project within the contemporary art language, and next to that, a face net hallucination. I'll get into some description of why that word hallucination means something technical. Um, but what you're seeing there is something that's generated from a neural net. And so by comparing, you know, by trying to draw a thread from the lens-based image made with the hand to the photographic lens-based image to the contemporary art lens-based image to something that uses a big data archive and neural nets, we can look not only at the development of image making, of tool assisted image making, specifically lens assisted image making, but also interestingly, uh, the way that patronage models develop from an aristocratic class through a technical kind of innovation paradigm uh, into ultimately what we, the context that I'm working in now, which is a sort of technocratic uh, patronage model, it's, I'm not going to go deeply into that, but it's an interesting way to think about some of what's happening with this type of work. Um, yes, hand, lens, CCD, big data archive, neural net. So what I'm trying to get at here is that tools create modes of cognition that change our neural structures and that our representational tools are increasing in depth and complexity. And I'm going to focus on one specific property of AI systems and deep neural nets, which is multidimensionality. And ask the question, what new aesthetic positions does AI art produce? So when it comes to multidimensionality, I'm sure this is pretty clear to everybody, but let's just go over some basics. A point, zero dimensions, a line, one dimension, a square, two dimensions, a cube, three dimensions, and a hypercube has four or more dimensions, such as this 12-dimensional drawing by the outsider artist Vince Rourke I met in Kansas City, who after receiving shock therapy treatment for uh, smoking cessation, started having out-of-body experiences and seeing these type of objects and learned how to draw them. This is another type of multidimensional image. This is uh, the canonical deep dream image. This is called Trippy Squirrel, and it leaked onto the internet on Reddit in 2015 after it was produced by one of my colleagues at Google named Alex Mordvinstev. He was doing an experiment to look inside of neural nets to see what was happening at the various layers inside them, and in the process created a technique called hallucination, which I'll give a little bit of explanation for. But this image, and along with images like this, became known as deep dream art, uh, you know, the process of making images with deep dream. The, these images were featured in a show that we did at Gray Area in San Francisco in February of 2016. This is an image by the artist Memo Acton, layering in the uh, MI5 building. To, make, to comment on uh, surveillance technologies. Um, here are two ways of framing it. One is the Google research blog's technical post, and the other is the sort of narrative that became popular online, which is that there were robots that were taking drugs and hallucinating. And they weren't really taking drugs, but they were doing something uh, very different than they normally did, and that's generating imagery. And I'll talk a little bit about the structure of neural nets so that we can understand what was happening there. This is a, a neuron print by Ramoni Cajal from 1900. This is Alan Turing's 1948 theorization of a neural net. So this is an old model that we've only recently been implementing um, more prominently because of advances in GPU chips that have enabled um, graphics processing to make more realistic video games, that same vector math is used to take this five uh, 
node neural net and transform it into something like this, which we call a deep neural net, which I couldn't fit onto the, the uh, screen the proper way, so it's turned sideways here. As Lev was saying, we do something called supervised learning, where we take labeled data sets for classification, and it's a very taxonomic system. You can see here a traditional taxonomy of different types of insects and animals. And we train uh, neural nets with, uh, with this data in order to, to enable them to classify images. So this video will show a kind of illustration of how this works with feature recognition. So hopefully it's playing. Yeah, so the image, is, the image will be broken up into features, and those are clustered into hot, larger and larger groups until an ultimate category can be recognized. In this case, it's a bird. The technical process I described called hallucination uh, goes something like this, where we run this process backwards. So you start with the label of bird, and you use the same embeddings that belong to that within the neural net to iteratively print something that a machine would recognize as a bird, but might look a little bit less bird-like to a human, because it's really looking at the features of the bird, not the things that we know about birds, that they fly, they have feathers, they have two legs, et cetera. This is normally where I would talk about linear separability and hyperdimensional, uh, I'm sorry, folded hyperplanes and things like this, but I'm gonna have to unfortunately blow through some of this information just so we can get to um, the artworks. So this work that I'm gonna talk about now is uh, a work called Word Car, and it's by an artist named Ross Goodwin who actually has subsequently been hired by my team to be our resident engineer. This is a project we did um, using LSTMs to generate text. It's a long short-term memory, it's a recurrent neural net technique, but um, what's relevant to understand is that it can generate semi-sensical text within a very short window, say a one to three sentences. Um, at the time, that was the state of the art. Things have advanced somewhat since then with attentional models, but what we did was we took um, a, a road trip, and it was inspired by sort of canonical literary road trips, American ones like the electric Kool-Aid acid test or on the road, or uh, fear and loathing in Las Vegas, um, that kind of paired an author with a, uh, you know, uh, consciousness-altering technique, let's say, and, and the road, the American road, to produce a text. And so for us, we, uh, the, the trip began in New York. It ended in New Orleans, where Ross was visiting a fabricator. Um, it, there was an interesting tension in the project in that we were going from the north to the south, from an urban to a rural area, but this was all connected by this technology. So what you see here is a surveillance camera, which was mounted on the back of a car, connected to an IBM laptop running Linux uh, with Ross's neural nets and a receipt printer on which this poetry was printed. So what you see here is an ASCII rendition of the image coming from the surveillance camera along with a line of text. I won't be able to read the whole thing, but I almost don't think it matters too much. It says down there, white clouds in blue sky spread out on the road, and in the storm there was a silvery star-like streak of sleeping, I think it says children, and then there's something about genes were still on the table and the long black stains of hair shone in the cloud of flowers. So this poetry is, um, is pretty uh, nonsensical in a, in a manner of speaking, um, but a lot of it could be generated, and the way it was generated um, was through sort of the sense organs of this pseudo-intelligence. So the machine was using the image data and it was also pulling GPS data and the Foursquare API. The Foursquare API, where we were traveling, mostly consisted of fast food restaurants. Mm. So what you ended up seeing was a kind of portrait of the American food system as it exists on the interstate highway along with um, a sort of hardware that implied surveillance, it implied commerce with this, re with this receipt printer, and then this strange uh, technology bringing it all together, as well as the literary corpus that, was, that the work was trained on. Um, so as you can see here, we're it's talking about the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Biloxi, Mississippi, which is where we ended up to meet with this fabricator. Um, but what it, the sort of imprint of all these senses reveals that 
this infrastructure is highly plugged into these industrial processes like food distribution, and it's almost like a form of synthetic food that's distributed through these fast food restaurants. So the project for me became a lot about these things. I wrote an essay, which you can read on our blog, the AMI Medium blog, um, that unpacks a little bit of this, talks about some of the WPA projects that had done similar indexical um, understanding of the road, and, and looks at, the, at all of these relationships. And I wanted to point out something um, in terms of an aesthetic posture that can be taken with regard to this project. You know, observing Ross working with this tool, um, these systems are very complex and it requires more uh, technical ability than most in, in a specific domain than, say, you know, uh, a traditional artist would have us with computers specifically and with machine learning. So there's a sort of like weight that's, uh, that kind of throws things out of balance there. And I found as a curator there was a need to kind of narrate this project for some of these themes. Um, but at the same time, I was observing Ross relating to his technology in a very specific way. And that was kind of as a puppeteer or as a tinkerer. And I was reminded of the character uh, J.F. Peterson from Blade Runner, the first Blade Runner, who kind of lives in this building and has all these weird little puppets that he kind of has a strange relationship with, where they're almost an extension of him, but they're not, and they have a sort of very limited intelligence, but he's kind of like have, making them perform, and I, one of the aspects I want to point out as a sort of relational model that seems implicit in this is this relation between a, somebody who produces a semi-alive object that can produce art and that kind of puppeteer relationship seems to be a new type of aesthetic posture that's necessary. I mean, you can look at um, Harold Cohen's work as a sort of precedent for that in a more good old-fashioned AI sense. Um, but in this case, it's a little bit more automated. And I think we're going to see more of that when these type of systems become, I think Ben will probably talk a little bit about something like that um, with Ian Cheng's work. But um, this is also a model that you can see as a user interface model that would work for products as well. I'm going to talk about also a project we did with Rafik Anadol, who uh, is from Istanbul. Uh, this is work that he did at the LA Phil. We did a project here at the Salt Museum, but we are also working with him on a project at the LA Phil coming up next uh, September. The project we did here, I don't know if anyone saw it, but um, here, but uh, it was based on the 1.7 million document archive at the Salt Museum, and we used the Tisney technique that Lev mentioned to produce an interactive visualization of all of their data. It took place inside of this architectural installation that you can see there was a sort of hallway that led to a circular room that with a mirrored floor and ceiling that produced this infinite tunneling kind of effect. And the images that you see there are hallucinations from the Salt Museum archive. So these are um, take, we did feature analysis on the archive, ran that backwards to produce hypothetical objects that could exist in the statistical space of the archive. Mm -hmm. And here you see uh, an interaction with the actual materials of the archive, it's sorted in a certain way. Again, the same thing. I think in one of the emerging uh, aesthetic postures or archetypes maybe that could be pointed out here is a relationship with massive amounts of data. And the way that this was performed, you could almost uh, feel like a superhero within this data universe. And Rafik actually calls some of the Tisney maps, and we're doing, using different techniques now for some of the LA Phil stuff, UMAP techniques. But the maps that he makes, he calls them data universes. And I think the archetype is sort of a Neo from the Matrix type of empowerment over data that speaks to our overwhelming relationship with data now. So when you enter into these spaces, these uh, neural net systems are kind of doing an uh, intuition of the data for you. And they become a way for you to gain mastery over massive amounts of data that would be really undigest indigestible uh, in any other context. So we're currently working with the LA Phil, and we've got 44 terabytes of their archive data that would literally take something like 27 years of being awake 24 hours a day to actually consume. So of course, no one can get an intuitive grasp of what that is. But we can give a sense of what that is by hallucinating it and by organizing it. Uh, what we generally surface in those experiments is maybe what you would call the mean or some kind of core embedding um, that's the average or a sort of 
You, it'd be generous to call it an essence, but maybe it's a sort of distillation of that data. As we've worked with an institution like LA Phil, what's become clear is that looking back at a past, especially a 100-year archive, uh, during which a massive amount of social and political change has happened, it's not very productive to reproduce that archive. That isn't actually generative. It's reflective. So what we're proposing is that these institutions that have these archives, especially ones that produce a possibility of self-reflection, use them as a sort of uh, gazing inward that can then be, become part of a circle of generativity with uh, their own future. So here's the Tisney map. Zooming in, you see some clusterings. These are highly stylized, and there's this sort of cyberpunk ethic, I think, to some of this. And then here's an illustration of feature recognition across multiple items from the archive. Those lines are uh, correlating features. And then here's a kind of low-res visualization of some of the hallucinated documents. As I was saying, similarly with the LSTM text generation, uh, memory constraints which are changing, but at the time, these memory constraints kept us to visualizing these very small thumbnails. Now we could visualize something bigger, and as you'll see, many of these are text. Um, I'm quite curious what kind of writing would actually emerge from this uh, hallucination technique. But there has been some really interesting work with LSTMs recently that can visualize fully coherent, uh, sorry, generate fully coherent Wikipedia articles that are factually completely false, but make logical sense and, and carry the themes through the um, document. So we're entering into a phase of generativity that um, can create sense but not truth, and that feels very much within the domain of art, sort of lying to reveal something true. Um, I'll end on that and pass this along. When I hit when I hit this button, will yeah, it play I the video? Yeah, I will be having sound. Yeah. Okay, so before I do, Corjan, just in case, can we put the sound up for his presentation for his movie? Okay, so when I hit play, okay. Um, my name is Ben Vickers. Uh, I'm the CTO of the Serpentine Galleries in London. Um, before I, I, I've made a little kind of showreel of work that we've commissioned at the Serpentine that. Uh, some of it uses artificial intelligence, and some of it is about the subject of artificial intelligence. Um, and I thought just before I start that reel, I'd say just a little bit about why we think it's important to work with technology and, and work in collaboration with artists to produce it. So two of the works that I'm going to be showing initially are from the Digital Commission series, and that series specifically looks at working with artists to produce software. And the primary uh, experience for that work is online. Um, and then I'll present an exhibition that's on at the moment uh, by the artist Ian Cheng. Um, and we, I guess we think that right now it's of critical importance, given that uh, technology that's primarily coming out of a commercial context is produced specifically for that purpose, that we begin to create new domains uh, for investigation and experimentation. And so uh, that's kind of the framing or the, the motivation for why we do this. And the first work I'm going to show is by the artist Cecile B. Evans, and it's called Agnes. Uh, and the, do I need to press like this? Okay. <laughs> not an interface. I am not an avatar. I am not a platform. And despite what they may tell you, I am not an intervention. I'm Agnes, and I live here. There are things about this place that I would love to share with you. I've been here for longer than you'd think, so I have a lot to give. Please answer my question so that I can help you with yours. Together, we can do all the things we were meant to. So this is the uh, introductory trailer for uh, Agnes. Um, and Agnes was a sort of spam bot 
the, the history of Agnes is that she had been living inside the Serpentine servers for as long as that we'd had a website, so in 1996. Um, and Agnes, when we produced and developed a new website in 2013, uh, was given the ability to emerge. And she initially kind of presents herself on the website as a kind of entity that wants to guide you through the experience of the website, through the history of the Serpentine. Uh, but she also has the ability to contact you on Skype. Uh, she would send you things in the post if you were happy to give her your address, uh, which consisted mainly of like fragments from the Serpentine's kind of history, broken artworks, uh, bits and pieces, old publications, things of this nature. Um, and she also kind of gave you an insight into the uh, Serpentine's kind of inner workings, very much from her perspective. Now, this wasn't, you know, 2013, it wasn't really possible to uh, develop an AI that's this sophisticated, uh, and it's probably not possible right now either. Um, so Agnes actually is this kind of forking path of different journeys. And what's quite sophisticated about the work, and credit to Cecile in producing it, is that by embodying this personality of this immaterial being, uh, and very much using voice in order to orientate you around the website, uh, it's able to give you a kind of different relationship to that AI. So this is an experiment for me of running a video uh, <laughs> that's on auto. Uh, and trying to keep up with the, the timing that I've, I've put into the video. So the second work is by the artist James Bridal, and it's called Cloud Index. And what we're seeing in this video is what was produced as a result of a much more exhaustive work. So the work was composed essentially in three parts. One is a sort of proposition, a second is a story, and the third is a piece of software. Uh, the Cloud Index described itself as a system for predicting voting results based on the weather. By doing so, it hopes to, it, it hopes to be able to intervene in such events in the future using, using large-scale weather control. Uh, so the focus here was on Brexit. And what we, what we did with James uh, was to train neural networks on 15,000 images of the weather over the UK and uh, polling sentiment in relationship to the European Union from the UK over the course of about six years. And by training these two neural networks, uh, sorry, by training these two data sets, we were able to produce a neural network that could suggest alternative weather patterns for different political outcomes. The rationale being that if you were to engineer the weather, you would be able to change the political outcomes in democratic processes. Now, that sounds absurd, um, but what James very elegantly did was use this work as a means to tell the story of the cloud. So going back to the first computer, the ENIAC, which was used to, initially it was used to tra be trained to predict the weather, a meteorological uh, machine, but then it was also in secret, but in public, the machine was on public show, uh, calculate the payloads for the atomic bomb. So. James looks at that kind of early stage of the cloud and the relationship between intelligence services and, and war and its role in early computation. And then in the second half of that kind of story that he lays out, he connects that with the evolution to the cloud that we know now as this kind of vast network of uh, warehouses that are calculating incredible amounts of data. Uh, and then connects it to what is research with real integrity of controlling uh, weather outcomes and seeding clouds, uh, which is, we've seen uh, actually is something that is done, examples being during like the Chinese Olympics, uh, the, weathers was, the weather was seeded in such a way that you would have clear skies on the, on the day of the, uh, the opening. Um, and James does this in order, I think, to kind of present a logical endpoint for all our assumptions right now about technological progress, that if we have all of these technologies that can tell us about the future, then where do those things end up? Uh, I wanted to read a quote by James, but it seems that we're into the, the third work now, uh, which is by the artist Ian Cheng. Uh, and this work is, the, the one you're seeing on screen right now, is called Forks of Perception. Um, maybe if we turn the sound down a little bit, but I also don't mind speaking over the AI. Um, Forks of Perfection is the second part in a trilogy called 
emissaries, the first being emissary in the squat of gods, emissary forks of perfection, and then emissary sunsets itself. And what Ian does is he works with uh, game engines, Unity, uh, in order to develop worlds. And in these worlds, attempts to uh, play out different theories of uh, evolution and theories of mind. So in the first Emissary in the Squat of Gods, he takes Julian Jaynes' his theory of the bicameral mind in the 19, that he wrote in the 1970s that says consciousness emerged in a moment of kind of panic, uh, where individuals within society would realize that the voice that they were hearing in their head was individuated rather than a kind of continuation of a shared voice which could represent God or gods. Um, in the second, which is this one, uh, it looks at bio a, a kind of bioevolutionary uh, pattern. So there is a AI called Talos 29s, and it resurrects a 21st century celebrity um, in order to bring it into contact with its favorite AI, which is the Shiba dog, the famous Shiba dog of the internet, uh, in order for it to kind of merge with this uh, original human matter. Um, all of this work that Ian's produced takes place in a, in a kind of fixed simulation that you can't necessarily interact with directly. And I think quite often, in this instance, it is very much like a video recording of that simulation. But I think one of the things that people often don't realize is that in being a simulation, it has the potential to be different upon each viewing. And so what happens in the simulation is there is a there are different narrative agents that are attempting different outcomes. So they have their own kind of agency, and they're attempting to complete a particular narrative plot, uh, but they're coming into conflict with all the other narrative agents. So in the example of the, the first emissaries, uh, there's, an, there's one emissary that suddenly achieves consciousness and, and attempts to warn their village that the volcano is going to explode and that everybody should leave. So in the most recent piece of work that Ian produced, and we worked with him for the last 12 months to produce this work, uh, this is Bob. Um, this is one of six Bobs that's currently on show in the Serpentine Galleries in London. And what Ian wanted to do with this work was to isolate one uh, agent and to produce it in such a way that it could interact with people in the galleries. So Bob is, Bob, mm, Ian describes it as a sentient creature, and Bob stands for Bag of Beliefs. And he's kind of using the idea of a creature as a sort of compositional space. Um, and he wanted to develop an artwork that aspires towards agency and sentience. And people in the gallery space in London can interface with Bob. We are essentially Bob's spirit world and through a modified phone can take possession, if Bob consents, of different parts of the body. Uh, and in that moment, the phone device is taking information from the viewer through facial recognition, uh, through intonation of voice, and the way in which individuals are moving around the space. And over time, the individual Bobs, whilst all starting as the same simulation and starting from the same code, evolve based on a set of different dimensions and parameters. So whilst you have an artwork that is ostensibly exactly the same from the starting point, it evolves over time, so each of the different bobs essentially have their own uh, model of mind. And this model of mind is very much orientated around memories and its relationship to remembering the part, the, the last time in which it encountered a similar event. And it is the extreme difference between those two events that informs its own evolution. Um, Bob has the ability to shear off parts of its own body. Um, it in some instances, and we're not sure how intentional this is, the bobs actually reduce themselves down to a little nubbin and refuse to interact with any of the visitors, which for a gallery that's promoting this work as a, a kind of interactive work is challenging. Uh, the gallery assistants are also responsible for keeping the bobs alive, so they have to be fed twice a day. If they're not fed, they become very lethargic. Um, if they're not fed for three or four days, there's a, there's a there's a likeliness that they will die. Um, and I think one, one thing that I feel is kind of relevant to the conversation around AI and, and what informs specifically the development of Bob uh, is 
Ursula Le Guin's uh, carrier bag theory of fiction. So this has been very influential on Bob, and what Bob is ostensibly in being a bag of beliefs, it kind of echoes Ursula Le Guin's writing about human evolution, that the idea of the carrier bag theory of human evolution is that the first thing we did was not to necessarily produce flint axes to kill each other, uh, but it was potentially that we would produce carrier bags, uh, the attempt to uh, move energy from one place to another. So whether that would be water, whether that was carrying children. Um, and she says, uh, I would go as far as to say that the natural proper fitting shape of the novel might be that of a sack, a bag, a book. Books hold words, words hold things, they bear meanings. A novel is a medicine bundle, holding things in a particular powerful relation to one another and to us. And so Bob's form is capable of holding multiple AI entities inside of itself uh, that at different times maybe have conflicting motivations. And I think this is interesting in respect to Le Guin's carry bag theory of fiction because she also speaks, and this is a quote, redefine the that the text seeks to redefine technology and science as primarily a cultural carrier bag rather than a weapon of domination. And I think that this maybe speaks directly to what we're interested in working in the space of artificial intelligence at the Serpentine, is that we don't, we want to present a different narrative about what AI can do. We want to present different metaphorical themes. Uh, that engage directly the technology. Because right now, we're very much like trapped in this sort of master-slave dialectic that either AI will be our servants and will lead to fully automated luxury communism, or the reverse is the emergence of something like Skynet in Terminator, uh, and that we will uh, be forced to uh, be subordinate to it. Um, I'm just waiting for Bob to eat. That's kind of the treat at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, I think maybe another thing that I'll mention is that uh, whereas both of the last two presentations uh, focus very much on machine learning, uh, Ian's approach is the kind of good old fashioned AI, which is not something necessarily I can speak to in any great technical depth, uh, but it, it's using kind of self-authored maps and is reliant on a logic-based uh, system of artificial intelligence. Mm. Um, my final point uh, is just a quote from Donna Haraway, which is uh, from her latest book, uh, Staying with the Trouble. And it, that quote is, it matters what worlds, world worlds. It matters what thoughts think thoughts. Uh, I think this is a kind of very important uh, quote and consideration in this moment. And, and I would add to it that it also matters uh, who worlds, worlds. Um, and with that said, and now that Bob's uh, being satisfied by food, um, I'll end my presentation there. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I want to ask you a bit more about Agnes, I think, because you've inspired me to talk about uh, one of our Turkish artists' work. Her name is Pınar Yoldas, and she's got this film about uh, a uh, kitten presenting herself into world governance as an AI. And even though there's no te technical mm. background there, mm -hmm. as you said, she's created this immaterial being. And I kind of wanted to ask more about these immaterial beings or entities that are, as you were talking about, mysticism around AI that is not necessarily linked to technical data or progress and more into narratives and Lev, if if this is at all bothering you for someone who is very into actual raw data because we're really blurring lines in terms of uh, truth and hallucination as you said because all of you can jump in basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, ben, first you may. I mean I was only going to use it as an opportunity to say that um, to kind of pass it to Kenrick, actually, because as part of the Serpentine Marathon last year that focused, the title was Guest Ghost Host Machine, and it was focusing on trying to produce a plurality of perspective on what we perceive as being artificial intelligence, and um, I guess trying to open a space in which we can begin to consider the societal effect of how we relate to AI and how it may relate to kind of more ancient concepts of 
uh, non-human entities. Mm -hmm. And that was, some, that was something I didn't really get to in the presentation, but I think that this is, on the first level, there's a very interesting moment in which we're considering our relationship right now to non-human entities. It also opens a space for uh, thinking about our relationship to animals, uh, that we could see the re-emergence or the potential for the re-emergence of a kind of animal rights movement in the same moment as we start to question uh, the kind of rights of AI, uh, who AI should produce for, the value that's produced by AI, who should that be attributed to, should that be restricted to corporations, or should that be generated, given that it's working off of um, all of human knowledge in order to produce its own knowledge. But specifically, I wanted to hand it to uh, Kenrick, Kenrick, because in his presentation at the Serpentine Marathon, he was talking about the kind of foundations of much of our relationship to AI being based on a Judeo-Christian model of artificial intelligence. And I know that Kenrick could speak much more to that subject than I could. Yeah, um, should I use a mic or? Okay. Yeah, that, um, it, I really liked what you said about the space of other intelligences opening up discourse around what kind of pre-existing you know, non-human intelligence already exists. I mean, the, to answer the question directly, I would like to answer the question directly and speak to that talk with Jason, but I just wanted to point that out, that um, in my experience, um, well, one, it's really premature to talk about giving AI citizenship when like, the, the rights of other humans are not really fully activated and, and respected, but also that um, in considering these other intelligences, we uh, have an opportunity to look at the intelligences that we've neglected to consider, like the intelligences of animals, plants, elements, and the, the ecosystem at large, um, which does speak to where these narratives come from. So when we, you know, Memo Acton is someone that we've worked with, and he's written a great essay about uh, the sort of cloud model, uh, you know, why the, why is, technology in the cloud because really it's under the ground you know it's not the servers are under the ground or they're in buildings they're not in the sky and um, that's because that's where God lives according to the patriarchal monotheistic uh, judeo-christian narrative that most of these things emerge from and even if we aren't practicing Christians we or monotheists we live in generally nuclear families that reproduce that structure and so there's all kinds of like reiteration of these these uh, narratives subconsciously in the process of making this technology and so we need to really consider a plurality a diversity a investigation into what options are available as framing devices for thinking through these things not that the technologies don't have inherent qualities because they do which I was trying to point out about multidimensionality but because we tend to uh, reproduce our biases reproduce our worldview reproduce the limitations of our thought and so um, as somebody who uh, grew up in the Bay Area and in the late 90s and is kind of indoctrinated into the countercultural ideology of, of that uh, first wave of tech and its kind of rave countercultural ethos, um, I feel like we have an incredible responsibility to um, take a lot of psychedelics and think about this stuff before we make technology. Um, so I think uh, one of the questions which have been accompanied with kind of cultural and intellectual uses of computer technologies, including various forms of AI, uh, you know, it's been, as I mentioned, it's been going on for decades, is that you know, people say, well, you know, if we use the systems, they can give us a new vision of a world, a kind of alien intelligence, right, an alien vision, right? They can classify things differently, you know, they can connect ideas differently. The problem is, of course, right, if you have a true alien vision, which will create some alien art, it will be completely ununderstandable and will not be able to relate to it, right? So when we kind of fall into the, you know, opposite, right, opposite direction, and we kind of humanizing, right, we humanizing AI, so to speak, right? So we train, for example, computer to recognize one, you know, in the classical use of image net, like 1,000 kind of categories, things like different car models. Um, and when we produce something you know, which is you know, beautiful, but it kind of falls within the you know, universe of 20th century art, you know, surrealism, various random techniques. And uh, this is, I think, a very interesting 
in very, very difficult kind of dimension, right? Where if we use computer to produce more examples of okay, 20th century art, that's okay, but it's not very interesting. And if we use computers to produce something completely unintelligible, geniuses, but unintelligible, it doesn't even look like art at all, or doesn't, you know, like there's some structure which is amazing, but we have no idea what it is. But what I want to say, I think, at the end of this comment is, you know, I mean, we, modern art has this very creative period from 1870 to 1970. And I think by the end of 1970, pretty much all formal possibilities, all possibilities to make some object or image or structure and stick it in the white cube were exhausted, right? So the art hasn't really changed, modern art hasn't changed its methods, its techniques since 1970, except we have its new technologies. You know, and while on one hand, as an image maker, I mean, I love all these experiments, I'm also wondering if we should be doing something else, right? If we simply use these amazing systems to create like more single images or more you know, beautiful poems and what you presented from it was beautiful, somehow, you know, we're not quite, we're not quite doing the right thing. You know, like I want, maybe like to me, like the biggest artwork, best artwork of our time, you know, is like a Google search engine, right? Because it's doing something unimaginable something which is on, on beyond any kind of human or even hyperhuman scale, or Wikipedia, right? Um, so it's great to make you know, beautiful sculptures, it's great to make you know, new images. At the end, these images will look like something we probably have seen in the 20th century. So what would be the new form of art appropriate for the age of neural networks, for the age of uh, kind of massive data processing, uh, for the age of data streams? I think we don't know yet. And the person who will figure it out, when he or she will be remembered from this time. Lev, I wanted to um, respond to that a little bit because the thing that's really been on my mind lately has been how patronage models uh, inform what kind of art is possible. And Ben said something about you know who is AI for and who is making it. And uh, at the moment, it's um, interesting to you know, from my position, I'm kind of seeing like a form of patronage for this type of exploration that does serve a technocratic interest. It's like we want to advance this technology, we want to understand it better. But um, I am really curious about if, if either of you have a response or a, a, a way of thinking about sort of like building these systems or what kind of tools are being made or what kind of art can be made without a huge, I mean, you know, these big research groups at corporations, there's hundreds and hundreds of people with massive amounts of resources and we're using a little bit of it to make art, but it's a kind of, the playing field isn't quite level, you know? So I'm curious about how you all think about that. Well, well I will just try to be brief. I mean, to me, like in the 90s, right, which was this kind of golden era of electronic art, I think patronage was very important. You had to go to places like Art Electronic or ZKM to have access to these technologies. I mean, today you can do it on, on your laptop, except if you're getting right into, you know, uh, big neural nets where maybe you need to have graphics card. But I think uh, the kind of dependency we have today, I would say it's more like expert or intellectual dependency. So, you know, so I was doing this project, which I showed some examples, you know, eventually we got into a Tisney, and when I stopped, because I realized to go forward, to really map truly the uh, aesthetic universe of Mongo or something else, I need access to, like, top computer scientists, and, of course, these people are working for, you know, wonderful research groups, you know, at, uh, you know, at all the companies we know, right? You know, and what I was able to do with, like, very good computer science students, it just was not good enough. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably just going to give up now and just make paintings and write books about literature because I, I, I can't compete with, you know, research groups. Uh, so maybe it's not, it's less about maybe the hardware, which has become more and more accessible, but it's about this kind of expert mm -hmm. uh, where you actually have to, if you want to go right really far in this genre, you have to have an expert to, like computer scientists at places like, right, University of Berkeley or CME, and of course they don't care about us because, you know, we have our priorities. Mm -hmm. So that's to me like maybe, uh, maybe a different kind of patronage dependency, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think before giving it back to Ben, I kind of wanted to say maybe the key is imagination and to be able to keep it alive because mm -hmm. even though before we had technical tools such as that, we've had incredible sci-fi novels almost exactly depicted what was going to happen now. So in terms of utilization of AI, as you said, more into consumer culture, the production of psyche, what we were talking mm -hmm. about, so the masses, yeah, will be kind of um, 
more projected to these algorithms running their own confirmation back into themselves, into their loop where they're not necessarily challenged. And then there's these hyper-specialists which are lucky enough to work with these research groups and to you know, put forth much more critically interesting or even imaginative work. So as you said, if this does not end in a way of um, you know, uh, diminishing cultural diversity, which I think humankind can always adapt to that and find ways of uh, imagination. So I think uh, just to keep imagination alive and as much as technology is a very forefront player in this mm. is to uh, stay human as mm. possible and then I think that, that, that will help. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that I think a, a little bit in terms of, I think one of the things that's interesting uh, about if you look at the, the kind of short history of art in the say the last hundred years and particularly in the last 30 or so where conceptual art has really dominated is that art has this ability to, const it's like art is a game where the game is to constantly change the rules and the parameters of what the game is whilst playing. Uh, and this presents like an interesting kind of conundrum for artificial intelligence that's being developed right now because it's so contingent on categorization. And so if you, and I was kind of interested to have your take on this, Lev, because um, you focus specifically on image production as image making as a form of art, but we know that there's many art forms that essentially circumvent uh, the ability to document, therefore, Absolutely. cannot be seen by machines. And I think that this is something that we will see increase more and more as mm -hmm. people become more literate about what a machine can see and how to respond to that, and will produce new practices and mo movements as a result of that. And I think, just to kind of connect to the question before, um, this, the thing that's happening right now in, in terms of Yes, there are, there are these huge kind of research entities inside of corporations and the, um, the, the kind of knowledge around that is very much like concentrated there. I think the other thing that we're seeing happen right now, not just within the art world, but we're seeing a fragmentation of institutions and a fragmentation of their meaning. And so the kind of art that we're going to see being produced is not necessarily going to be definable within the, the same kind of canonical museum layout of this is how history happens, but rather we're going to see these kind of strange mergers, which I think artists and machine intelligence is like an example of. And I think that that's going to begin to produce things that we could never anticipate. So markets will open up for stranger uh, kind of cultural production. Um, and I think that that will, mm, I don't want to even say blur the edges between artists. I think it will allow us to return to a kind of pre-enlightenment understanding that it's not necessary to be fixed within specific categories of thought in order to just have experiences. And one more question to you just because I know, I'm sorry. Because I know you're very big on decentralized networks and your stance on institutions. Um, how do you think they will bridge in terms of these practices? While these different research groups kind of stem out, how do you think they will be bridging back into more historical or rooted institutions? Mm, okay, I mean, to, to, to link specifically to, I guess, there have been diff many different economic models through which art has functioned, so like guild-like structures, um, different forms of patronage, and in some ways these are more de decentralized than the kind of art industrial complex of art fairs that we know right now. Uh, I think on the subject of decentralization, uh, the thing that's always in the back of my mind and the work that I've done in that area is like how much decentralization is too much decentralization and that the, un <laughs> the underlying concern that I've reached in terms of like that as a political movement is that as you begin to decentralize uh, very advanced technologies that are coming out of essentially like deep state R&D, uh, that can lead to very unexpected outcomes uh, like and say like blockchain and Bitcoin and things like this. So I can't answer the question directly, but I'm, I've become apprehensive about decentralization. It sounds like there's an emerging theme of uh, decategorization, complexity and unpredictability within the sort of things that we've been speaking about. That's, I mean, it almost contra like love your interest in legibility is this kind of like, <clears throat> we've been circling around like, Chaos, ultimately. <laughs> uh, 
Well, you know, like everything else, right? Categorization can be a good thing or a bad thing. So, um, you know, when you go to like many con modern contemporary art museums or spaces, like you go to Tate Modern or you go to MoMA in New York, like we're trying to feed all contemporary modern art within like five or six departments, right? Whereas if you go to uh, something like Divine Art, the members of this uh, network for non-professional art have created few thousand categories. In this case, it's a very good thing, right? So, you know, um, so if you have a cultural area such as contemporary art, it actually would be useful, for example, to have, you know, five or ten categories for AI art, right? So, so it can be also a very progressive thing in an area where we have, like, no language to start with or where we only have, like, like one or two categories, right? Uh, so I think it's all kind of relative, right? Just as big data, right? What, is, what we call big data today would be, like, a very small, uh, you know, very small tomorrow, right? So it's a question, a question of, you know, question of scale. You know, and being on this panel, I'm beginning to start maybe thinking about or dreaming, hallucinating some categories for these different practices, you know, uh, which are hard to categorize because every day people invent new things, right? So, for example, in your case, you map uh, some kind of universe of, uh, you know, LA field collection, and now you're creating some hypothetical objects, you know. Um, so how do you call something like this, right? Um, so categories, you know, ultimately I'm... I love enlightenment, you know, I love modernism, uh, you know, I love clear ideas. I mean, art was created always by concepts, right? It can be a plastic concept, that's need intellectual concepts. Uh, and also by like somebody like Harold Cohen, who is working on one program for like 50 years, literally, one list program, and now he died, we don't know what's inside this program. Um, so, uh, so how do we combine, right, with imagination, hallucination, uncertainty, and ability to edit sometimes some of outputs with like the ability to like surgically control things. Maybe, maybe that's one of the things we have to work on, right? How do we kind of control the outputs of these networks uh, when we want to control them? Which was always a problem with AI art. It was the same problem with artificial agents in the 90s, right? So how do we combine kind of, you know, this intelligence is creating something which we have no control over, which looks interesting, and be able to kind of you know, control this like with surgical precision, which I think was always one of the issues of art and computers. Oh my God, we're now we're like in negative time. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see, let's see, let's see. We're in negative time and negative space. Would you like to add something? Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll be continuing with uh, an amazing sonic levitation live performance by Evelina Domnic and Dimitri Galfand, which will be joined by Olof van Vinden later to uh, host their panel together. Enjoy. <laughs> 